Now time for question period. The member from... Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, in a letter dated August 15th, your health minister told 12-year-old Maddie Vanstone that the province will not fund the medication Kaleidico solely due to its high cost. In other words, you and your government callously sent this young lady home to suffer with cystic fibrosis. Premier, your disregard for the well-being of Maddie is simply wrong. Your government is willing to squander billions when it comes to gas plant cancellations, orange and e-health, but no money for a sick child. For seven months, Maddie's classmates, teachers, and family and friends, many of whom are here today, have helped Maddie pay for this medication out of pocket. Thanks to these people, she is now symptom-free. This afternoon, I'll be presenting petitions that they have collected on Maddie's behalf. Premier, is this the Ontario we can expect from your Liberal government, where 12-year-old children have to fundraise to keep their friend alive? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, and uh, I was very pleased to meet with uh, Maddie and her mom, Beth, this morning. The Minister of Health and, uh, and Long-Term Care and I had an opportunity to sit down with her in my office, and I, uh, I just want to commend her for her courage and for her, her very articulate expression of her situation. Um, the decision, uh, the decision on uh, funding drugs, Mr. Speaker, as you will know, is uh, is one that has a, a process. The Pan Canadian Alliance, Mr. Speaker, is negotiating. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have been obviously pushing behind the scenes. We want to fund Kaleidico. There is no, there is no question that the government wants to fund Kaleidico, Mr. Speaker. But. We are part of we're Member part from of the PM Canadian Carlton process, will come to order. Mr. Speaker, so that children Answer. like Maddie and people like Maddie across the country will have access to this drug, Mr. Speaker. Thank I'll you. More to say in the supplementary. Supplementary. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, Premier, you know the facts. You know that Kaleidico is the only medication available that treats the underlying causes of Maddie's cystic fibrosis. It allows her to breathe to play with her friends, to go to school, in short, to have a life. Yet, you continue to deny Maddie funding for Kaleidico solely on the basis of costs and keep hiding behind this pan-Canadian alliance. Minister, how much is too much to save a child's life? Will you commit today to funding Kaleidico for Maddie? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, and of course, we don't put a price on a human being's life, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, as the member opposite knows, and as Maddie and her mom Beth and uh, the minister and I talked about this morning, the negotiations are being led by Alberta. Alberta Order. has made three proposals to the manufacturer, and they have rejected each one, Mr. Speaker. We need Vertex, which is the company, to step up and be a partner in these negotiations because, Mr. Speaker, we need this drug. We need this drug to be available to children and people across the country, Mr. Speaker. So it is not responsible for Ontario to undermine other provinces. We are going to do everything in our power to expedite this process. That's the conversation we had with Maddie and her mom this morning, and we are going to push very hard and make it very clear Answer. that it is inappropriate that Vertex would not engage in this process in a very responsible way. So we are going to push on that, Mr. Speaker, Thank you. and work to expedite this as quickly as possible. Final supplementary. Member from Central York. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is also to the Premier. Premier, Maddie's classmates are also from my riding, and I agree with my colleagues. Your single cold concern seems to be the cost to the system. In fact, you said it in a letter. The drug is too expensive. But I want to ask you, have, ever, have you ever thought of the cost to the system if you don't fund this life-changing medication? Days and days stretching into months in ICU, a lung transplant at some later date when it's, a donor becomes available, yes. and the recovery that goes with that. Thousands and thousands of dollars are to, will be spent. Maddie needs this medication now. Yeah. Premier, there are very Question. few people who have the power to make a life-saving change for someone else. This is a lifesaver for Maddie, 
and a defining moment you. for you. Are you ready you. to commit to funding this? Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, before we start, I've been hearing some very, very quiet people during the question, and I hope to hear the answer as well in the same respect. Premier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In Kent, Middlesex will now come to order. Carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, I and uh, the Minister of Health made it extremely clear to Maddie and to her mom this morning that we want to fund this drug, that we want this drug to be available to her and to all of the children across this province, across this country, Mr. Speaker. And so we are going to we are going to push, Mr. Speaker. We are going to push the company. We're going to make it very clear that this process That'll needs do. to be expedited, Mr. Speaker. What we know is that the way that the research was funded for this drug was it was uh, it was funded through charitable dollars, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and so we believe that it is inappropriate for the process to have to drag on. We are going to push to expedite the process. That is what we said to Maddie, and we will keep her and her family in the loop. And Answer. Mr. Speaker, I think it is commendable that the community is taking such an interest in this, and we are going to do everything in our power to make it move more quickly. Thank you. New question. Member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Premier, last week, disturbing and disgusting comments made by the Minister of Culture were brought to light. Just prior to the Thornhill by-elections, the Minister made comments trying to pit Ontario's Jewish community against Ontario's Chinese community for political gain, trying to pit communities against one another. Premier, Order. is this the kind of behaviour that you've led your ministers to believe is acceptable. This isn't one of Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There is not a member in this House who is more committed to inclusion and pluralism and multiculturalism than the Minister of Tourism. Yeah, yeah. The minister, the, it's my understanding that the minister has Remember offered an apology uh, last Chatham, week to Kent, the members Essex of the Jewish we'll community if, uh, if there was offence taken, Mr. Speaker. He, the minister is an unwavering supporter of multiculturalism in this province. What he believes, Mr. Speaker, and what we believe is that every community should be treated equally, Mr. Speaker. That everyone in this community, in this Answer. society, should be treated with respect and with fairness. That is what he believes. That is what guides his behaviour, Mr. Speaker. It's what guide. It's what has guided his public and his private life, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Mr. Speaker, those comments were out there for three weeks. I believe that the Minister of Culture stood behind those comments, and the only reason that he apologized Order. is because he got caught, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. In his comments, the Minister played some of the worst stereotypes applied to the Jewish community. He did all this while trying to persuade members of Ontario's Chinese-Canadian community to send a message along ethnical political lines. This old Chicago-style ethnic politics doesn't have a place in Ontario. If you don't fire the minister, you're condoning his behaviour. Will you show some character, make the minister answer for his actions, and then demand his resignation, Premier? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm sorry, but coming from a member of a party that intentionally works to divide people, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I really believe that the division that the party Order. Order. When I stand, you're all out of order when you keep talking. Mr. Speaker, 
My understanding is that the minister commended Stephen Harper for supporting one of Ontario's strong cultural communities and simply suggested that that support be broadened to support all communities. That is our position, Mr. Speaker, and we are not a party that wants to divide people. We do not want to divide rural and urban, Mr. Speaker. We do not want to divide labour from employers, Mr. Speaker. We do not want to divide northern from south. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The member from Oxford will come to order. Carry on, please. Finish. If that this minister knows Answer. better, certainly than I do, the importance of a diverse society that includes and member supports all communities, Mr. Order. Speaker, that is what motivates him, and that is what motivates Answer. us. Data, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member. The, the member from Glengarry Prescott. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell will come to order. I have these in my mind. I remember, but it takes so long to get attention. The member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. Don't point at anybody. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. My riding of Thornhill is in the same area as that of the Minister. It is one of the most diverse areas in Ontario. I, I caught that. The, uh, stop the clock. Uh, the member has to direct the question to the, the, the member that it was placed to in the supplementary. Carry on, please. Please read her. Sorry. My, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. My riding of Thornhill is in the same area as that of the minister in question. It is one of the most diverse areas in Ontario, including in the diversity of are significant numbers of Chinese and Jewish residents. As a member of the Jewish community in Thornhill, I was proud to put my name on the ballot and be elected to represent all our ethnic communities. You can, of course, imagine my disappointment to hear of the minister's hurtful comments about the Jewish community Question. in the Chinese media, comments that are obviously in direct contrast to the ministry he is tasked with promoting. Mr. Speaker, is the minister prepared to resign immediately and seek training to better enable Thank him you. to represent all ethnic groups? Thank you. Premier. Uh, sorry, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. <laughs> Speaker, thank you very much for the question, and I'm not resigning. Yeah. Speaker, along with all Ontarians, I take pride in our reputation as an eagle, inclusive and multicultural society. In fact, Speaker, this is why I chose to immigrate to Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, I call on the Harvard government to recognize the important contributions made by all our cultural communities, including Filipino, South Asian and Chinese Canadian. Speaker, it is important to extend support eagerly to all cultural communities in our great province. Answer. We are fortunate to have so many of them in Ontario. It is what makes Ontarians so unique. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Does the Premier think that private energy traders should be allowed to siphon off ill-gotten profits and leave Ontarians paying the bills? Minister of, en oh. Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we have a mixed system in Ontario. We have public uh, uh, companies participating 
Mr. Speaker, we have private companies participating in the energy sector. The investment that the private sector has made in Ontario is in the multi-billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the, uh, the energy system uh, spends uh, roughly 18 to $20 billion per year, Mr. Speaker. It's an enormous, uh, it's an enormous operation. There's Unbelievable expertise and experience in the private sector. We're in partnership with the private sector, Mr. Speaker, in operating the system. And I'm waiting for the supplementary, Mr. Speaker, because I have some questions for that member. Thank you. <laughs> supplementary. <laughs> Why don't you give us some answers to begin I, with? I look forward to answers, actually, <laughs> Speaker. It would be novel. It would be welcome. Ever since Ontario's private energy experiment began, Ontario has been the Wild West for privatized energy trading. The regulator says, quote, there are presently no market rules aimed at market gaming. And in not having such a rule, the Ontario market stands alone. And the regulator says it's unrealistic to expect that private energy traders aren't exploiting those loopholes. Can the Premier tell us when we will see some action to protect consumers. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, when the NDP party last formed government, uh -oh. they signed nine private power generating contracts for natural gas plants in a five-year span. But Mr. Speaker, I would like to know from the leader, of the, from the uh, critic from the third party, what their plan is for the energy sector. I believe they're opposed to new nuclear. They haven't said yes to, to no new nuclear. They're against refurbishment, Mr. Speaker. They're talking about 50% plus or minus of the energy system. Now, how are you going to replace that when you eliminate all nuclear? When will you start? How much will it cost? And most importantly, in a lot of your important writings, how many jobs will it cost? Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, sometimes I think the Premier is just evading a question, but in this case, I don't think they understand the question. And I'll give it another shot. <laughs> the Liberal government has had 10 years to address the issue of companies playing games with the private market. For people stuck paying the highest electricity bills in the country, this is just another example that, of a government that just doesn't seem to care about the mess in Ontario's electricity system. After years of inaction, the regulator is now consulting on how to solve the problem, but we've seen consultations stretch for years. And people looking at their bills, trying to pay them, need to know that their interests are going to be protected. Can the Premier tell us when, Question. if ever, she plans to take some action Never. on people gaming the system? Mr. Speaker, uh, I was fortunate enough to be out of politics for three or four years, several years ago, and I was more fortunate, Mr. Speaker, to have been on the board of the Independent Electricity System Operator, IESO, which manages the system. Not only do they manage the system, but they work cooperatively with every other jurisdiction in North America to manage the system so that it's secure, safe, and that there's no gaming. Mr. Speaker, you can find the banking industry, you can find the legal profession, you can find any operation where people are trying to break the rules and try to tighten them up. The ISO is among the most respected in North America in terms of managing the electricity system, including the energy market, and you should be aware of that after all these years. Answer. Thank you. New question. From Toronto Danforth. Yeah, and frankly, they say the rules aren't in place to protect the system. <laughs> another question, with your indulgence, Speaker, to the Premier. That was just another example of a system that's not being run to protect the people of Ontario. Jane from Toronto wrote to us, being on a fixed income, every dollar counts, and to have hydro being dumped cheaply to the U.S. is simply unacceptable. But the Premier has told Ontarians that bills will be going up 42 per cent over the next five years, and her minister has dismissed concerns about subsidizing energy exports to the U.S. Does the Premier think that the status quo is working for Jane? Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we initiated a program 
uh, for uh, uh, price mitigation about uh, 13 or 14 months ago, the industrial electricity uh, incentive. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are companies who are benefiting by power reduction costs by about 50 percent accessing that. And to be clear, Mr. Speaker, the way they're financing those, those lower prices is by using our own surplus power. We've gone from a deficit, Mr. Speaker, to a surplus in power. We're using that surplus of power, Mr. Speaker, to reduce rent, uh, uh, prices for, for industrial consumers. Mr. Speaker, we also have a significant number of uh, mitigation, but Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about our long-term energy plan in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. I would appreciate it more if he would answer my question in the supplementary, but Speaker, people are working harder than ever just to stay afloat. Internal federal government reports say the middle class is being hollowed out because the cost of living keeps rising. Alex from Ottawa wrote to us, quote, I agree that the high energy costs in Ontario are not favourable to the hardworking middle class. Does the Premier understand that skyrocketing hydro prices are making it harder for people to get into the middle class and to stay there when they get there? Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is paying maximum attention to mitigating electricity prices. We spent $31 billion making the system reliable and clean, Mr. Speaker. That puts some pressure on prices. We're moving forward, Mr. Keeping Speaker. We are taking costs Keeping out of the system, promise, and the same price yeah. increase that he's referring to, the same graph, the same data, shows that over the next 20 years, our average increase will be 2.8 per cent uh, and 2.3 per cent for industrial, Mr. Speaker. They don't have a policy on energy, Mr. Speaker. I want to hear what they're going to do. Their leader, when asked, can you lower prices, said no. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, people know that hydro bills are get, taking a bigger and bigger chunk out of their household budget. Claire from Burlington knows the effect on her family. She wrote to say, quote, I make a good living and the high bills still really hurt our family budget. I can't imagine on the strain on workers who make less. For 10 years, hydro has been getting more expensive and the Liberal government has said those bills will go up 42 per cent in the next five years. 42 per cent. What does the, the Premier have to say to people like Claire? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would hope as a good MPP he would tell his constituent that, first of all, we put the 10 percent discount on every bill. Secondly, Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, Mr. Speaker, gives a tax credit for $963 per year for qualifying individuals, medium low-income people, Mr. Speaker. That also gives a benefit of $1,097 per year for qualifying seniors. Did that member advise that uh, constituent that those benefits are there, that those privileges are there by tax credit. Did you? Yes or no? Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Minister, Still is. you're spending money like it's the Russian Olympics. <laughs> During my morning coffee this Saturday, I came across a half-page colour ad intended to convince me temporary construction jobs for Pan Am are a huge win. But the only win here is that the Minister of Pan Am job is actually temporary, especially given your recent alienating comments. Show us that you're the minister responsible for these multicultural games and tell us how much of our money you spent about the temporary Pan Am jobs. And then resign. Thank you. Minister responsible for the Pan Pair of Pan Games. Speaker, thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. Speaker, I'll give you a, one example. One of the largest items in the additional investment is the athletic village, which is about $700 million. Wow. That makes up about 70% of the $1 billion. Speaker, the village has always been the responsibility of the whole sewer section and outside the $1.4 billion operating budget. Speaker, TO 2015 is the organization that run the, uh, uh, the, the game Listen. in terms of staging events, in terms of planning, overall planning, and also PPAP, uh, our he ministry, is responsible for transportation and for security, and we are working very hard. As you know, that is only one year, about five months to the game. So, Speaker, Answer. this is what we are, uh, at the moment, a lot to do, but we are sure that we're going to complete a good 
to uh, 2015 come July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I'm really glad after two years you finally came clean on the Pan Am Village, by the way, but that wasn't the question. Minister, let me tell you how much you blew on these ads. You blew exactly $41,000 on this one-off Pan Am ad. For colour, it cost her an extra $15,000. That's, that's way too much. You could have skipped the colour. Just co skip the colour alone and sponsored an athlete yourself. Your priorities, Minister, are totally out of line, and your peers know it too. In fact, a full-time babysitting team has been put in place requiring the minister to report bi-weekly to the Premier's office and to Cabinet offices. The truth is, he's a designated ribbon-cutter, and later, he's going to be the Liberal fall guy. Minister, save yourself. Step down and allow someone who has pr their priorities straight to actually lead these games once and for all. Thank you. Minister. Time. Speaker, uh, thank you very much for your question. Schedule. Speaker, I would like to. I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased to inform that the uh, Pan Am game, the Pan American game, is on time, on budget, perhaps ahead of time, and also under budget. Speaker, Speaker, the member opposite this allegation had zero credibility. Allow me to give you some example. Speaker, he issued his own press release about the the village cause but told the public he did not know it wasn't in the $1.4 billion budget afterward. Speaker, he says, is a human resource expert, but has not heard of a completion incentive program. That's new to me. Speaker, he claimed security is going to cost $1 billion, which is absolutely wrong. Speaker, he publicly claimed our Pascal reception in October was five Answer. times the actual cost. Wow. Those are zero credibility allocation. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Last week, AMCO issued a report confirming what most of us already know, namely that Ontario has by far the highest hydro rates for industrial users of any comparable jurisdiction. And no one knows this better than the residents of southwestern Ontario, where tens of thousands of good-paying manufacturing jobs have been lost because of this government's high hydro rate policies. This simply can't go on. When are we going to see an end to the job killing hydro rate policies that have crippled manufacturing in southwestern Ontario and throughout the rest of the province. Thank you, Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we meet regularly with AMCO. We have a very good working relationship with them. We uh, regularly accept their advice, Mr. Speaker. The numbers that were in the uh, Star article uh, referring to that particular survey do not include price mitigation programs, Mr. Speaker. Price mitigation programs such as the Industrial Electricity Incentive, which reduces rates for qualifying companies by up to 50 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Industrial Conservation Initiative, which reduces prices by 20 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Many of the members of AMCO participate in that particular program. The Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, Mr. Speaker, creates the industrial rates in Northern, Northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada and lower than 44 American states. We're working hard to mitigate prices, Mr. Speaker, and we're continuing to do so. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much. It's interesting to hear the Minister of Energy ca counter the AMCO report. It's, it's the reality for the rest of the province. Tens of thousands of good-paying manufacturing jobs lost, and now we hear that the government's own long-term energy plan calls for a 30 per cent increase in industrial hydro prices by 2018. While Ontario still struggles with an unemployment rate of 7.5, cities in the southwest are even harder hit. London, 7.9. Niagara, 8.8. Sarnia, 10 per cent. Outrageous hydro rates and increases are killing jobs across southwestern Ontario and across the province. When good Ontario jobs hang in the balance, how can this government possibly justify a 30 per cent increase to the highest industrial hydro prices in North America? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, she's referring to in increases that are, yes, referred to in our own long-term energy plan looking forward to the future. But if she looks at the same graph, she looks at the same data, if the numbers that she's giving have any credibility, then the numbers I'm giving now have credibility because they're in the same graph and the same document. The, the price increases for industrial commercial electricity moving forward over the next 20 years, Mr. Speaker, is 2.3 percent. 
That compares to at least 3.0 per cent, and the five large provinces in Ontario have higher projections. But, Mr. Speaker, she's got to look at the price mitigation programs. Mr. Speaker, under the Industrial Electricity Incentive Program, last month, Detour Gold was one of the successful proponents in the first round and claims that the program will save them $20 million in 2014. I met with one of the Conservative Answer. members, with one of his members, and we went through details of that company. And if they get in touch with their LDC and IESO, they can find ways Thank to you. reduce their rates, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Vaughan. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Wow. As parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance, I have spoken on a number of occasions with a variety of Northern Ontario organizations, and I've had the opportunity to visit municipalities like Timmins and like Elk Lake and Espinola. Speaker, I am very proud to be part of a government that understands the importance of the North and the importance of mining, uh, the mining sector for our province. Ontario is among the top 10 mineral investment jurisdictions in the world. As a result, 24 new mines have opened here over the last 10 years, and that's more, Speaker, than anywhere else in Canada. Currently, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada is holding its 2014 annual convention here in Toronto. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Northern Development and Mines please update the House with respect to this annual convention and explain Question. how it is showcasing Ontario's mining sector? Thank you, Minister Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and a great opportunity to tell the members of the legislature about the uh, uh, Prospect of Developers Association Conference. PDAC started yesterday uh, with the Premier. I, I was able to uh, host our annual Ontario reception, welcoming uh, uh, many of the delegates, uh, municipal leaders, uh, industry leaders, First Nation, Métis, a number of my colleagues. Great to have them here. A wonderful event, and certainly uh, PDAC is a tremendous opportunity for us to showcase the, the many successes of the province. As, uh, mining sector at our Ontario Pavilion, which we are actually opening up this afternoon uh, officially at 1 o'clock, and we, uh, we ask you to join us. It's in a remarkable um, a convention, well over 25,000 to 30,000 uh, delegates every year. Uh, certainly, one thing we want to continue to uh, uh, make clear is that the province remains one of the most attractive destinations for mineral exploration investment in, uh, in North America. 2003. Answer. Explorations were 193 million last year, over 600 million. Look forward to providing more details in my supplement. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank, through, through you to the minister, I thank him for not only his response but the extraordinary work that he's doing on behalf of the people of Ontario. And I want to thank the minister for his update. I mean, frankly, Speaker, those figures that he referenced are impressive. And I'm certainly pleased that Ontario is hosting this important international conference. And I'm certain that the international delegates that are here will enjoy all that our city here in Toronto has to offer, and hopefully they'll also have a chance to explore other beautiful parts of our province. As we all know, Speaker, the mining industry is very important not only for Northern Ontario, but for the entire province. And I know that our government continues to engage both corporate and First Nations partners to make sure that we are creating the dynamic and innovative business climate that we need for this sector. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is our government showcasing our support for such an important industry at this convention? Question. Thank you, Minister. On for the question because it certainly is important for us to uh, to create and to support a, a dynamic business climate for the mining sector and it really is about also achieving a balance uh, mr speaker uh, but we are providing tax credits we're providing grants and geological data that is so crucial to the the sector we are very much demonstrating our our leadership um, working through of course the one the historic modernization of Ontario's mining act and and that again is promoting a vibrant competitive industry uh, helping to keep Ontario a world leader in the industry. We need to work with the mining companies, with First Nations, um, our Métis Nation, other government partners, municipalities, to, uh, to improve our province's competitiveness Answer. without compromising our environmental responsibilities. Uh, by attending this tremendous annual convention, Speaker, we're able to strengthen our relationship with our key partners in the mining sector Thank you. and continue to grow the economy. Thank you. The question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health, and I want to ask the Minister about her decision to ration personal support services for Ontario seniors. Speaker, when the Minister announced the government's assisted living for high-risk seniors policy, what the Minister did not tell us is that up to 80 per cent of current applicants 
would receive no benefits under the current rules. She also didn't tell us that seniors who are now getting essential services on site in their seniors' buildings would be cut from those services. Here's an email, Speaker, many of which my, my colleagues and I'm sure hers are getting from across the province. It reads as follows. The seniors are devastated because they recently found out that the province is defunding the Alternative Community Living Program. And chats will not be available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Question. The question is, from this constituent, how is it possible to have these disabled seniors lose their services? Thank you. Speaker, I'd like her to answer. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'm delighted to talk about uh, how we are strengthening the home care sector and the community care sector. In fact, this is our single most important priority, Speaker, and our, our money is uh, where our mouth is on this one. In the last uh, budget, we increased community and home care support by 6 percent. We were able to achieve that only by holding steady on a number of other elements of our health care system. Speaker, as a result of our investments, 200,000 more seniors are getting the care they need in their home, in their community. The speaker, the home care sector is an increasingly important part of our health care system as we shift services to the community where people get the care they need in the place with the highest quality for them, and that is in their home whenever possible. We are expanding yes, services in the community, Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Speaker, that rhetoric is not going to go over with the seniors in this province who are losing their services. In a memorandum dated June 19, 2013, the Community and Health Services Department of York Region announced that the new Ministry of Health policy would have serious implications to seniors in York Region. Not only would the level of personal support services be reduced, but according to that memo, it warned that more than 80 per cent of current applicants would not receive any services. The minister said the money is where the mouth is. I'll tell you where their money is. It's in scandals. It's in e-health lost precious millions. It is in gas plant losses. It is in her track record of not giving precious medications and prescriptions to people who need them most. It is in her lack of oversight at Orange. That's where the money is. And that's why they're now rationing services for seniors in this province. I want to know from the minister, will she rescind that policy today? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, I think it's important that the member opposite actually hear the facts about what is happening. And I will be the first to say, Speaker, that we are changing how we are delivering care in this province, and we are changing it for the better. CCACs help over 650,000 people get the care they need in the community. That is 200,000 more people than when you were in office, Speaker. We, uh, we've increased the number of patients who are going home after a hospital visit by 26 per cent. These are people who otherwise would have been destined for long-term care. They're getting more supports in their home where they can live uh, in a, with a high quality of life speaker where they want to be. Over the past two years alone, we've increased the number of uh, people receiving home care Answer. services by 76,000, and we are continuing to expand, Speaker. In order to do that, we need our PSWs working in home care, and we have plans for Thank that you. as well. Question the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. To bring our trouble CCAC system in front of a legislative committee. I heard a whole lot of messaging and some lukewarm support. But this afternoon, I will be tabling a motion that will allow the legislature to take immediate action on the growing problems at our CCACs. Can the minister tell Ontarian whether she will support this request to finally take action with CCAC? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, as I said to the to the member from Newmarket Aurora, community care is where we are investing significant new resources, and they, that community care sector is an increasingly important part of our health care system. 
We need to continue to get the highest possible quality of care and the best possible value for money of those home care dollars. And Speaker, I can assure you that as we invest more in the home sector, that is taking pressure off hospitals as their ALC rates come down, Speaker, and as the wait lists for long-term care are actually getting shorter, not longer. So, Speaker, I am committed to home care. I am committed to community care. I am committed to, to strengthening the home care and community uh, care sector, Speaker, and I welcome all advice on how to do that. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not talking about home care. I'm talking about those agencies, the Community Care Access Centre, and the number of problems uh, that they are facing. We went on a LINS review committee. We heard more complaints against CCAC than we did against the LINS. Speaker, this government is fond of repeating the same line and making promises that have no clear timeline attached. For months, we have heard that legislation will be introduced that could cap CEO salaries. But after years of pushing for executive pay cap, New Democrats wants to see this government take action, not make more promises. I ask again, will the minister support this urgent review of CCAC? Thank you, Minister. Uh, Speaker, I, I do think it's important, and I know the member opposite does know that CCACs are the body that uh, that manage our home and community care sector. Speaker, so uh, you can't uh, uh, you can't uh, underestimate the value of that uh, that coordination. Speaker, we're spending 260 million dollars more this year than last year. That's one year's increase in the home and community care sector. Speaker, 110 million dollars of that will meet home care uh, growth and service demand. There's a $60 million alloc allocated towards a five-day target for complex patients requiring personal support services. Speaker, $15 million is allocated to achieve a five-day wait time for nursing services in all ends, and $75 million additional to community supports, organizations such as Meals on Wheels, uh, adult day programs that help support the people who need the care and their caregivers as well, Speaker. This is a very important focus of our ministry's strategic plan. It is central to the implementation of our Answer. action plan for health care, Speaker. Here, here. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough, Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. This government has been investing in people, investing in badly needed infrastructure, and supporting an innovative and dynamic business environment in Ontario. We all recognize a strong and vibrant Aboriginal community strengthens Ontario culturally, socially, and economically. I know this firsthand. In my own diverse riding of Scarborough Guildwood, there is a significant off-reserve Aboriginal population. While we make progress across many different areas, can you inform this House on how we've been helping improve and create greater economic opportunities in Aboriginal communities in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, speaker, thank you for that question. We've been active on many fronts, creating many opportunities from both the private sector and communities to participate in a meaningful way and a, to help Ontario's economy. Now, one such way that we're doing that is something that I recently announced is the continuation of the New Relationship Fund, which is a part of the government's economic plan that is creating jobs for today and tomorrow. This comprehensive plan and its six priorities, six priorities, focus on Ontario's greatest strengths, its people and its strategic partnerships. Through the New Relationship Fund, Ontario is supporting Aboriginal organizations as they build consultation capacity, industry partnerships, and engage in sustainable development. That's good for Ontario's economy. That's good for First Nations, Métis, and Inuits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, thank you to the Minister for that update on the new Relationship Fund. Obviously, this is a great investment both in helping people, communities and businesses, helping create a more robust business environment. With my colleagues, I've had the opportunity to meet Aboriginal and First Nations group across Ontario. In January, for example, I had the chance to visit Moose Factory, 
Ontario and meet with representatives from the Moose Cree First Nations. So indeed, Speaker, I know how important this investment is across Ontario to our Aboriginal communities. Through you, Speaker, will the minister expand further on just what is happening with this investment and how it is helping our Aboriginal communities? Thank you. Uh, Speaker, the fund was originally announced as a four-year commitment in 2008, but it's been so successful that we will continue to invest in the new relationship fund on an ongoing basis. Now, here are some facts about it. We've enhanced the value to better meet the needs of the Aboriginal communities by increasing the amount available in core consultation funding from $80,000 to $90,000 per year. What does that actually mean? What happens then? Well, over the five years that the fund has been in existence, there have been 540 jobs created across Ontario that provide skills and training to thousands of Aboriginal people. The fund has supported a further 500 projects undertaken by 193 First Nation and Métis communities. The fund, projects, uh, the fund projects help Aboriginal communities hire staff, Answer. host meetings, draft business plans, develop important business tools. This is what creates or helps the Aboriginal communities create businesses. This is what's good Thank for you. Ontario and the Aboriginal community. Thank you. New question, the member from the Team Carlton. My question is to the Premier. Uh, the testimony of the OPP Commissioner is very clear. The investigation into the Liberal government over the deleted emails in the gas plant scandal is real. It is ongoing, and it could see jail time of up to 14 years for anybody who is commit committed of a crime. The time has come for the Premier to follow our lead and call for a judicial inquiry into the $1 billion gas plant scandal and the role that her party played. So I'm asking the Premier today, will the Premier show some integrity and denounce a judicial inquiry into the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal? Thank you. Premier? Um, government House Leader, Mr. Speaker. Government House Leader, sir. Mr. Speaker, really, I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed in the member for uh, the question Very that she's just raised. I mean, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we uh, have a situation where the OPP, we are aware, is looking into a matter, and I think that members of this House are very aware that we allow uh, the police, we allow law enforcement to do their work. We don't uh, draw conclusions or, as, as she has done, uh, uh, make insinuations here in the Legislature. Mr. Speaker, let's allow uh, the police to undertake their work. What Commissioner Lewis confirmed to the committee is that he is getting uh, excellent cooperation from uh, uh, the government and those that he is asking questions of. There are will be a, a, a point where he will report back, Mr. Speaker, and until then, uh, as yes, I said, Mr. Speaker, I think this question is really beneath that member. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, that answer was actually beneath that minister. That's probably why he's deciding to run away from this place after the next election. The Premier admitted that the gas plant cancellation was a political decision. We know it wasted $1.1 billion that could have been used to ensure children across this province got the medication they need for their severe diseases rather than have to take their fight here at Queen's Park. She has been Premier for over a year. She has lost four MPPs in that time. She has lost her campaign manager. In fact, she's even losing you. Her government is in decline. The OPP is investigating. The OPP was very clear that there could be jail time for any crimes committed by this government. Her priorities are not those of this, premier, of, this, of this province. So I will ask again, if they will not call a judicial inquiry, as our leader Tim Hudak has asked, Question. will they at least call an election? Thank you. Uh, let the member from Renfrew sit down. Come right now, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to say on a, on a personal on a, on a personal note, Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciated her uh, her warm remarks, Mr. Speaker. But you know, Mr. Speaker, you can't run from it, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, in the last election, it was the leader of her party who was on YouTube saying if he was premier of this province, he would, Mr. Speaker, he would cancel the gas plans. The member from the PN Carleton will come to order. And I, uh, I don't need armchair quarterbacks. 
and uh, I would wish this to stop while I'm speaking. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, it was her party where we had candidates going out knocking on doors, sending out tweets, having robocalls saying the only way to cancel the gas plants was to elect the Progressive Conservative Party as the government. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, which she cannot escape, is that every party in this legislature had the exact same promise, Mr. Speaker. The question before us is how in the future can we ensure that the siting of gas plants is done in a better Way. That is what this side of the House wants to deal with, Mr. Speaker, and I think it's time that they came clean. Thank you. New question. The member from Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Rising hydro costs in this province are threatening the livelihoods of small business people. I know in Windsor, more than 30 small business owners have complained to Larry Horwitz, the chair of the Downtown Windsor Business Improvement Association. Do you know Larry? That's a good thing. They're worried about their, the cost of their hydro now, let alone a 40 percent increase coming over the next five years. This rising cost of hydro may force many of them out of business. What solutions can the Premier offer to small business owners in Windsor and in the rest of Ontario? Mr. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, there's a short-term solution and there are long-term solutions. The medium long-term solutions are in our long-term energy plan. We're, we're reducing uh, annual increases for the industrial commercial sector to 2.3 percent. The Bruce National Gray Energy Board will come to has order. the 20-year projections for all of the provinces, and Ontario is the lowest moving forward because we're not going ahead with $15 billion investment in new nuclear. We're not going ahead with $3.7 billion of power purchase contract with Samsung, and we're running a more efficient service, Mr. Speaker. Those numbers, those calculations are in the long-term energy plan. And when we get to the supplementary, I'll talk about some short-term solutions. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker Enwin, the local provider in Windsor for hydro, they have a real concern because they're charging the same rates now that they charged customers in 2006. So all the increases in hydro rates are on the provincial portion of the bill. Will this government assure small businesses it has a plan to fix its broken hydro policies before they're forced to close? Close! Minister <laughs> Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are addressing issues concerning small business. First of all, very small business have access to the 10% uh, discount on their bill as well as farmers. For those uh, slightly larger businesses, Mr. Speaker, if they work closely with their LDC, there are very significant conservation measures to minimize prices, Mr. Speaker. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I personally have been consulting with small business groups. We are looking at ways and means to support them moving forward, and uh, we hope that in the foreseeable future, uh, we'll have some price mitigation that will be uh, very well received uh, by small business. Two, your question. The, mem the member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Research and Innovation. Ontario's capacity to compete in the global economy is partly based on our ability to foster highly talented researchers. Canada is currently ranked sixth in the world in quality and impact of research, with Ontario comprising nearly half of the national research expertise. In my riding of Scarborough Rouge River, I'm often asked by constituents if it is a good idea for their children to study science during their post-secondary education. Mr. Speaker, as a parent, the answer is pretty obvious. However, I believe there needs to be more done to encourage students to pursue this path. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is the government doing to foster Question. and support the research and innovation in a province that will encourage more young people to get involved in this field? Minister of Research and Innovation. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for that question. Mr. Speaker, investing in research, in breakthrough research, has always been the most priority for this government because it creates jobs, Mr. Speaker. Our government is supporting innovative and uh, dynamic research. These researchers are creating the jobs for tomorrow, and our investment today in research is going to pay tomorrow to create jobs. Recently, we have announced, Mr. Speaker, $190 million for the Ontario Research Fund. $65 million of this fund will go to the Ontario Research Fund research excellence to support 140 research projects across the province. This fund has led to the recruitment and training of 17,000 highly qualified researchers who are running our research institutions. Mr. Speaker, investing in programs such as the Ontario Research Fund ensures that our brightest minds and their innovative ideas remain in our province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is good to hear that our government is committed to supporting researchers through programs like the Ontario Research Fund. Providing the necessary resources and support for researchers is critical to our long-term economic prosperity. However, keeping young, innovative minds in the province is also necessary to create the jobs of tomorrow. As a parent, I'm always pleased when I speak with students in my riding of Scarborough Rouge River who have both a keen interest in the sciences and a strong entrepreneurial spirit. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the government doing to help take the ideas of young minds to the next level and create jobs for tomorrow? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for that question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario government is committed to supporting young entrepreneurs by providing the support they need to grow and succeed in their business. Just recently, our government announced the Ontario Youth Investment Accelerator Fund. This fund is a part of the Ontario government's youth uh, and entrepreneurs to bring their investments into the, into the market. We have invested $295 million in the Ontario Youth Job Strategy, and $7 million of this fund goes to the Ontario Youth Investment Accelerator Fund. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of youth entrepreneurship in a, dy in a dynamic economy as ours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your question. The member from the to the Premier. Premier, yesterday on your radio show, Shelley Correa phoned in to voice her concerns about the negative health effects that wind turbines are having on her son. You failed to answer her question yesterday about the wind turbines, but maybe you will decide that you will answer the question that I have for you today. Do you believe that the intent of the Oak Bridges Marine Act was to include 50-story wind turbines? Well, I, I believe I did take the question from uh, the caller that the, uh, that the um, member is speaking to, Mr. Speaker, and, and what I said was that, um, and I will paraphrase because I don't remember exactly what I said, but what I know, Mr. Speaker, is that you know, we made a decision about green energy. That ex is, is exactly good. true, yeah. and that we want cre clean, renewable energy. We shut down, we've, sh we've shut down all the coal-fired plants, Mr. Speaker. We made that decision that that was in the best interest of the air quality in this province and people across the province, Mr. Speaker, the health of children, and that is a point that I will continue to make, Mr. Speaker, because it underpins the reason that we uh, moved into, uh, into the green energy. The other issue, Mr. Speaker, is the creation of 31,000 jobs. So there are contracts in place. There are approvals underway, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the uh, I know that the member opposite is aware of all of Thank those you. things, Mr. Speaker. Well, Premier, your government, through the Minister of the Environment, approved an industrial wind farm with turbines the size of Toronto skyscrapers. Whoa. Five of these turbines will be built beside what was supposed to be a natural, serene, <coughs> and tranquil Buddhist temple in my riding. These turbines will impact the Oak Ridges Marine, which is an environmentally sensitive yeah, geo exactly. geological <laughs> landform that is protected under the Oak Ridges Marine yeah, Conservation Plan. You promised, your government promised better communication it, right? with communities in citing these turbines. You, you did repeat that on your radio show yesterday. You failed to answer the people of Ontario called into your radio show. You failed to consult these Order. communities as promised. Will you make the right things right and call a moratorium on these yeah. wind turbines? Thank you. 
for you? Much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I was very pleased to be on the radio show and to take calls along with uh, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure and along with Theresa De Felice from CAA, Mr. Speaker. There were lots of questions that came in. We took as many as we could in the time that was available, Mr. Speaker. And I acknowledged, I acknowledged that the issues around uh, around the siting of wind turbines has been contentious, Mr. Speaker. I also made it clear, and I make it clear again, that we have put new rules in place, Mr. Speaker. We said we were going to change the process to give communities more, to give communities more input into where those uh, pieces of uh, energy infrastructure would be sited, Mr. Speaker. We have done that, and we will continue to advocate for clean energy, Mr. Speaker. There was an energy summit, an energy innovation summit here uh, last week, Mr. Speaker. People from across the country and outside of the country were here to share ideas about how we can do more to conserve and create clean energy Thank in you. Ontario question. and beyond. Yes, uh, my question is to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. Last year, the government tried to prevent the release of information on AODA compliance by charging hefty fees to the AODA Alliance. But the FOI that the AODA Alliance was forced to resort to revealed why the government did not want to disclose the information. 70% of Ontario private sector organizations with 20 or more employees had not filed mandatory self-reports on their compliance with the AODA Customer Service Accessibility Standard. Government knew that they were failing to effectively enforce their own standards, and they didn't want Ontarians to know this disturbing fact. Why is the Premier withholding information, and will she finally take action to enforce the AODA? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the premise of the question—I I need to challenge the premise of the question. We are, uh, Mr. Speaker, we are working to make sure that Ontario is the most accessible jurisdiction in the world, Mr. Speaker. I mean, we have uh, we have taken leadership in terms of a regulatory regime that that mandates accessibility, Mr. Speaker. We're the first in the world to require staff to be trained on accessibility, Mr. Speaker. We're the first in Canada with legislation that sets out a clear goal and a time frame for accessibility. By 2025, I have personally met with uh, David Lepofsky, Mr. Speaker, a number of times since I have been in this office, and we have had this discussion about enforcement and how we can how we can increase the uh, increase the uh, compliance by putting more enforcement measures in place. But the fact is that we are in a transition. Sure. There is no doubt about that, and it is going to take some time for all of our institutions and businesses to comply. And we are. We're going, to, we're going to encourage and we're going to uh, work with and we're going to make this jurisdiction the most accessible in the world, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. 70 per cent, I reiterate, of Ontario private sector organizations did not comply with mandatory rules this government set. Uh, the minister responsible for the implementation of AODA pledged to enforce the law until there is full compliance. He said it was his quote unquote top priority. Yet the government has taken no concrete actions, according to David Lepofsky, and has no pla plan in place to enforce its own standards. The government is failing to make Ontario accessible to those with disabilities, and they only have themselves, that is the government, to blame. Why should Ontarians uh, believe that accessibility is a priority for this government after months and months of empty promises? Question. Thank you. Well, because, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I, I don't know whether the member opposite is aware, but uh, in November of last year, approximately 2,500 enforcement uh, notices were issued to organizations that had failed to comply uh, and submit 20, 2012 accessibility compliance reports, so letters were sent out. Um, almost half of those organizations that received an enforcement notice responded by filing their overdue reports. The remaining organizations required to file are being issued director's orders with financial penalties many of those have already been issued mr speaker and these notices were in addition to the approximately 50,000 letters sent in the summer of 2013 to businesses notifying them of their obligation as well as offering them supports to help them meet the goal mr speaker 
It is imperative that we have put the regime in place, the, uh, the standards are in place, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and that now we work with businesses and we make them aware of what the requirements are. That's what we're doing. We are in communication with them, and we will continue to enforce Thank you. that compliance, Mr. Speaker. The uh, member from Kitchener-Waterloo on a point of order first. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to welcome Member of Parliament Romeo Saganesh from Mavatibi, James Bain Nunavik, and MP Claude Gravel from the riding of Nickel Belt. So thank thank you. you. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Earlier today, um, the Premier, in response to questions directed at her regarding comments made by the Minister of Culture, I believe, and as we are aware in this uh, chamber, Speaker, you cannot say indirectly what you cannot say directly, and I believe that Rule uh, 23H and K were breached, and if le allow me to explain. Rule 23H, I believe that the, the Premier, in an indirect way, accused every member of this caucus of having racist views and, and no, I've heard enough. Thank you. I listen, I listen very carefully uh, to question period. And I listen to the questions and I listen to the answers. And although uh, I would prefer a more temperate exchanges in this place, as many people do, I did not hear anything unparliamentary. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I'm still standing. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London has given me notice of his intention to raise uh, a point of privilege. His point relates to the legislation establishing the Eastern and Southwestern Ontario Development Funds and a provision in it that states, if a public announcement is to be made about a provision of financial assistance or incentives within each Eastern Ontario or Southwestern Ontario, as the case may be, the MPP who represents the affected area within the region must be given the opportunity to participate in the announcement. The member for Elgin Middlesex London states that such a public announcement has recently been made in his writing, but that he was not he was given no notice nor the opportunity to participate as required by the legislation. I am prepared to rule on this point of privilege without hearing further from the member from Elgin Middlesex London as state, uh, Standing Order 21D permits me to do. It is well established in parliamentary procedure that the application of privilege is confined to the proceedings in Parliament and to the activities of members in their parliamentary roles. Speakers of this legislature and elsewhere have consistently ruled that a member's work outside of the legislature and especially constituency-related matters do not give rise to protection of privilege. As stated in page 117 of the House of Commons Procedures and Practice, in instances where members have claimed that they have been obstructed or harassed, not directly in their roles as elected representatives, but, by, but while being involved in matters of a political or constituency-related nature, speakers have consistently ruled that this does not constitute privilege. This position has been made by, taken by speakers of this legislature as well. For instance, on April 26, 2001, ruling by Speaker Carr noted that speakers have consistently found, supported by the procedural authorities and the multitude of precedents, that privilege attaches only to a member's parliamentary duties and not to the subsidiary duties away from Parliament. On May 4, 2010, Speaker Peters noted in a ruling that, according to the procedural authorities and many previous speakers' rulings, parliamentary privilege protects members in the execution of their strictly parliamentary duties, not the constituency or other duties that may fairly be said to be part of their job descriptions. On this point, the second edition of Magnot's Parliamentary Privilege in Canada states the following, pages 222 and 223. The interference, however, must not only obstruct the member in his capacity as a member, it must obstruct or allege to obstruct the member in his parliamentary work. I appreciate that, that the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London feels that he has been deprived of his ability to do his job, but it is excuse me. But simply put, 
that it is that part of the job that is the important consideration in the case at hand. Simply put, parliamentary privilege is not applicable to the constituency related work of an MPP. The member may have a valid grievance, however, and I would note that a com complying with this law is always good policy. However, I cannot find that a prima facie case of privilege has been made out. There are no further there are no there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.